Hello and welcome to Policy Voices by Friends of Europe, an independent think tank with a difference. Each week from Brussels, we bring you powerful conversations with policy voices from around the world. Policy Voices talking policy choices. We're not part of the problem at all, of course. We're mandated by the UN General Assembly to do a particular job of work, and we have been since 1949. The fact that we're still here is actually an indictment of the political failure to find a just and lasting solution to the Palestine refugee issue. Hello and welcome to Policy Voices, Friends of Europe's weekly podcast on European and global affairs. I'm your host, Katarina Villanova. On the week the World Refugee Day is commemorated, I spoke with Jonathan Fowler, Senior Communications Manager for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, UNRWA for short. Jonathan joined UNRWA shortly after the 7th of October attacks and is currently based in East Jerusalem. What he details is an intense campaign against UNRWA by the Israeli authorities. But nowhere is this situation more egregious than in the Gaza Strip. As Jonathan calls it, it is a war of superlatives, and at no point in the history of the United Nations have so many UN personnel been killed in a war. The staff UNRWA employs in Gaza are local staff and are themselves refugees. During our conversation, Jonathan told me their stories. Like the story of a sanitation engineer who had lost his family and he still kept showing up for work to prevent a worsening health situation in his community. Here's my conversation with Jonathan Fowler, Senior Communications Manager for UNRWA. Jonathan Fowler, hello and welcome to Policy Voices. Thank you so much for joining me today on the show for a special episode in commemoration of World Refugee Day, where we'll be bringing into the spotlight the catastrophic humanitarian situation in Gaza. And just before we start, the disclaimer that... um, Given that we're talking about a situation that is rapidly changing, I just want to mention that we are recording this episode on 13th of June and only publishing a week later. So, uh, Jonathan, you are talking with me today from East Jerusalem. That's where you've been based. How is the current situation now where you are? Well, first of all, thank thank you very much for having me on the podcast. It, it's always appreciated. Um, so how's the situation? Well, I mean, you know, relationship status, it's complicated. I guess that's how we we could describe the current situation for our work um, in in East Jerusalem. We, as our Commissioner General, Philip Lazzarini, so the head of UNRWA has flagged, you know, there's this kind of multi-pronged attack on UNRWA, an attempt to um, dismantle the agency from um, people in the Israeli government and, you know, supporters, their supporters who, who... who, who basically don't believe in the the fundamental premise of our mission and, and, and believe you know that we if we remove UNRWA from from the picture then somehow the the Palestine refugee issue magically disappears which of course you know I mean for a number of reasons that's well to be quite blunt that's nonsense because um, you know you, you don't just remove one player from 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 a situation and and you know the situation is is somehow magically resolved we're, we're not part of the problem at all of course we're mandated by the UN General Assembly to do a particular job of work, and we have been since 1949. The fact that we're still here is actually an indictment of the political failure to find a just and lasting solution to the Palestine refugee issue. We're here, we carry on doing our work um, unbowed. This is a way of explaining that we're in a very, very, very complicated operation environment here in, in, in East Jerusalem. I want to situate the the situation that we're facing in in, in East Jerusalem um, in the wider context. In the West Bank, um, our staff are unable to move around freely and easily um, to do their work. Most of our staff are local, of course. So you have cases where, for example, you know, we provide education in the West Bank. You have a teacher living in Ramallah, say, working in a school in Jerusalem, uh, sorry, in Bethlehem. In normal times, you know, that would just be a short drive to work. But now with checkpoints, restrictions, you know, road closures, the person may take three hours to get to work or not get to work at all. Kids can't easily go to school. Our West Bank staff can't come to the um, office in um, East Jerusalem at all. It's about 300 staff who have to work from home. And then just one more point on this. The most egregious example of what we're facing, of course, is um, in Gaza. There, you know, we face attacks on our buildings. We've had 193 of our staff have been killed. 
So this is this is very much why Philip Lazzarini has talked about this as a, a part of a pattern. You know, it's like a multi-pronged assault against our agency when we are a humanitarian organization with a specific job of work under a mandate from the UN General Assembly. I will, of course, later in the episode, focus specifically on the work of uh, UNRWA staff in, in Gaza and uh, challenges. It's, I, I hate to use this word because it's much more than challenges, but um, I, I still wanted to focus more on the on the mandate of UNRWA and your work specifically because it's you, you joined UNRWA in October, so shortly after the October 7 attacks, and you've just been detailing very extensively now um, what it has been like to work for owner, but how does one prepare for it? I mean, it's it's unimaginable what you've been going through already in just such a such a few months. Yes, I mean that 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 that's a fair analysis. It, it's certainly, you know, at a professional level, this is the most complex operating environment um, I have been in. You know, I've, I've worked in in in. I was I'm a former journalist, but I've been in the UN for about ten years, and so I've I've worked in you know in in, in both of those professions in. Difficult environments, you know, I posted in Afghanistan and I was in Ukraine just before coming here, um, you know, and, and everybody knows that the nature of the situation there, the complexities of the work and what the United Nations tries to achieve, you know, in terms of support for the for the population. But what what we're facing at UNRWA, um, I mean, one, the, the war in Gaza is unprecedented in scale for this region, um, you know, the level of destruction the level of, of, of death, injury, you know, it's a war of superlatives. So wherever you look, you know, there's there's some new horror story in plain sight. And yet this has not been, you know, this war has been going for eight months. So it, it's, it's basically, you know, the amount of damage, the amount of death and destruction in such a short space of time is shocking. And it is the most dangerous place in the world to be a United Nations um, staffer, um, a journalist, a medical worker. I mean, regarding UN, UN staff, you know, we we know at no point in the history of the United Nations um, have so many UN personnel been killed in a war. The reputation of the agency has been, you know, we've been constantly under assault, uh, assault with misinformation, disinformation, you know, some with impacts. Others, it's just that we have to deal with this, you know, over and over and over. I mean that that's you know sort of professional and personal level. This, this this is what I mean. It's the most difficult, most complicated operating environment I've been in because um, it's I, I cannot think of another occasion where the United Nations NA, or you know any United Nations entity has been dealing with such a huge humanitarian crisis at the same time as, for example, it's been facing reputational attacks with huge implications for funding. And to get us situated, what is what exactly is that you do? So, what is the what is UNRWA's mandate? Sure. So, well, our, our mandate, mandate is kind of multi-level. So, I mean, just just to, to, to back up, I mentioned um, in response to a, a previous question, you know, we have had a mandate from the United Nations General Assembly since 1949. So, we're one of the oldest entities in the United Nations system. Um, you know, we're practically there at its inception. The reason why, of course, is that we were created as a very specific. There was, in response to a very, very specific sort of geographically confined refugee crisis, which was the refugee crisis caused by the Arab-Israeli war of the late 1940s. And that crisis, of course, has not been solved. It's one of the most protracted refugee crises in, in, in modern history. UNRWA, so what does that stand for? United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees. Now, um, so we, we provide sort of quasi-governmental services for Palestine refugees. And the, the sort of the goal of UNRWA is basically to provide the kind of services that might be provided by, you know, public entities. Um, so, uh, you know, education, healthcare, um, sanitation, um, I mean, within healthcare, things like, you know, sort of psychological support, these sort of things, you know, even garbage collection, this sort of stuff, to, to, to make sure that, you know, as much normality can be lived as possible by Palestine refugees, despite the nature of this protracted situation. This means they were actually a very kind of large organization compared to other UN organizations, um, because we have around 30,000 staff um, across the region, and the majority of them, overwhelming majority, are, are, are Palestinians, and within that, then almost all Palestine refugees it's about serving the community for which which people come themselves. 
But we, we also have a very specific geographical mandate. Sometimes people, yeah, I mean, given that we're speaking at a World Refugee Day, um, this is a significant point because sometimes people say, well, why can't UNHCR just you know do what you do? But the point is UNHCR isn't a service provider in the same way. No other entity in the UN does what we do. That's the nature of our mandate. But also for geographical, historical reasons, um, because UNHCR and, uh, and UNRWA were created around the same time. UNHCR is a year younger. Um, UNHCR was created to respond to all other refugee crises except ours because of the very different nature of this one, which is it's very geographically confined and so on. So we operate in five what we call fields. We operate in Gaza. Um, we operate in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. And then the third field, Jordan, fourth, Lebanon, fifth, Syria. So as you might imagine, the nature of our work is very, very different in each of those places. And also the nature of who our interlocutors are, because in West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza, you know, we're dealing with um, different players, different kinds of authorities. We have a relationship with the Israeli authorities as the occupying power. Whereas, you know, it's more like, you know, relation directly with governments in, in, in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. But so specifically about UNRWA's work in, in Gaza and how, I mean, I'm really interested in knowing how, how it changed, like how much did you have to pivot? So putting the challenges aside, you know, you mentioned specifically garbage collection, which of course it's essential to in running, um, you know, any, any community. But I also can imagine that given the current catastrophic humanitarian situation, it's not so much a priority now. So what was a priority before and what are the priorities now? Well, ironically, actually, garbage collection should be a priority now because um, because of the disruptions of the war. Um, I mean, there's huge, you know, huge numbers of displaced people spread to places where um, sanitation is, is a huge, huge challenge. I mean, you're talking about, you know, sort of 330,000 accumulated tons of garbage in the Gaza Strip, you know, with all the health implications so, but yes, the, uh, the I mean, the direct response to your question, I mean, provision of those sort of services in extremely abnormal times, as represented by this war, is very, very hard. But we have 13,000 staff in the Gaza Strip. Now, most of those are working in education. So we stopped schooling as soon as the war began, and we transformed our schools into emergency shelters. So, and, and um, most of our staff are actually displaced from their homes because they're garrisons like others. We have around three and a half to 4,000 of our staff who are able to keep working um, in, in this, this, this humanitarian tragedy. Uh, and that includes people who are trying to help with sanitation. You know, we, we have people, we've been out of contact, for example, with the North for many, many, many months, you know, the beginning of the war. And um, when we were finally able to send a mission there to see what was going on, you know, our, our staff who went there on the, on this convoy, they, they they met one of the sanitation engineers who who had just carried on doing his work, you know, heroically going to work every day. I mean, and this 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 colleague's family had been killed, and he was still going to work to um, to try to do something to prevent health impacts for the population. Um, in the surrounding community. People bravely continue to try and do those things. But overall, yes, I mean, the, the, the kind of staff um, that are still able to work on a regular basis in Gaza are, are what, what might, might, one might call them more sort of classic, you know, humanitarian. So those people working in logistics, warehousing, all this sort of stuff. But then also, of course, people working in health centers. Now they were already, you know, we, we have a, a huge ne network of um, health staff. We had around a thousand health staff operating in the Gaza Strip before the start of the war. Twenty-two primary healthcare facilities. Only six or seven of those are able to continue running, but we're still doing. Um, we have some smaller, you know, more basic health points dotted around the Gaza Strip. But you know, the, these people are continuing to do their to do their work stoically and at risk uh, to their lives. To just to try to alleviate the impacts. And I just wanted to mention one more thing here, which is that we do have staff who've also pivoted to other roles, you know, so people working in schooling who are now sort of working in shelter management. I, I did say schooling has stopped, but what I meant by that was formal education has stopped. But in fact, you know, we're continuing to try to deliver um, psychosocial support through education and play for kids in shelters because, you know, kids have to be allowed to be kids even in the most horrific of environments because this is the only way that we'd be able to undo some of the psychological damage 
uh, caused by being displaced and being caused, caught up in this war. And uh, how many people uh, does UNRWA employ nowadays in, in Gaza and how are you able to maintain contact with them? or if you are able to maintain contact at all? Well, contact is sadly erratic. Um, I mean, you know, we, we still have our employees, uh, you know, contracts haven't stopped because the, because of the war. I mean, this, this is, of course, a huge issue because, you know, people are, uh, people. some people are working, you know, out of sight, as it were, because it's very difficult to be in contact with them. So we can't sort of put in ourselves in a situation where we're, we're, we're sort of saying, well, you know, we have no evidence somebody's working, so they, they shouldn't be paid. I mean, that would be absolutely brutal, you know. We so we still, I mean, we still have our headcounts of uh, 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 of thirteen thousand people. Although, as I stressed, you know, we've tragically one hundred and ninety three of our staff have been killed. You know, some in the line of duty, others along with their families, and we fear that that number will rise just precisely because of the lack of contact. You know, we have active uh, messaging platforms with with colleagues. You know, and we're always trying to check in on each other. You know, we have a, a web of communication staff, including audiovisual staff in the Gaza Strip, who are providing incredible content so that the world can see what's happening and also to see what UNRWA is doing. You know, at risk of their lives, one of our uh, videographer colleagues was severely injured, you know, a couple of months ago and had to be medically evacuated. You know, I mean, it's like life changing injuries, this kind of thing, you know, but our colleagues, I mean, they put themselves on the line every day to do what they're, they're, they're supposed to do. And can, can you describe a bit what does a, a day in the life of UNRWA worker in Gaza look like nowadays? There's, there's no typical day uh, for, for our colleagues. I mean, the, the colleagues we do speak with, um, I mean, for example, you know, we, we have our archivist, um, our, our audiovisual archivist is, is based in Gaza. And I mean, it was very difficult to reach her uh, for some time, we we did actually fear for her well being, and then we finally were able to reconnect. And she'd still, you know, she once she was able to get um, decent enough internet connection to be able to continue working, she was back doing her work. I, I find this the, this this kind of thing phenomenal. But what is a typical day? Well, you know, the colleagues, I mean, say medical staff. Um, we were speaking with with one of our um, pharmacy staff so you know which is of course even more critical at the moment you know the, what the fuck making sure the right medicine comes in very very hard to get it in but then make sure it get the right kind of stuff gets to the right people and she's been displaced so one you know she's living in a tent with her husband and two children you know with all the difficulties that that imposes you know tents in the cold tents in the heat and and it's like a furnace in those tents now the colleagues say you, know, you, you barely and you have to sleep outside you know um, but yet things are packed so closely together that, you know, there's the risks of sort of human health and there's always the risks of having to redisplace, get redisplaced. I mean, the, the enduring comments that she made that stuck in my mind was, you know, I kiss my kids goodbye in the morning. You know, she, she might, I mean, it could even be some erratic times of day because she's doing long shifts and I might hear a drone in the sky when I'm in working in the pharmacy and I don't know what that means, you know, and literally, am I going to see them again? And that's like, yeah, I mean, nobody, nobody anywhere in the world should find themselves in a situation like that ever. Um, sadly, millions and millions of people do. But when it's direct colleagues of yours, you know, people you know, people you work with, you know, something like that sticks in your mind because it's, it, it's a very human reaction. Um, and yet at the same time, colleagues will say, you know, I can have that emotion, but it's also like, I don't have time to think about stuff. You know, I mean, we, we were, there's one, one of the colleagues who's lost a, a dozen family members. That's like, you know, scything through a family. And yet this person's continuing to work and, and, and said to me, you know, quite frankly, actually work is what keeps me halfway sane. The, the grieving, the impact will come when the ceasefire comes and when the war is over. And, you know, for our own staff, just like people across Gaza, the psychological healing, the challenge of that is going to be enormous. But, you know, a typical day is, is, is a day of fear, uh, a day of thinking, well, you may suddenly have to pack up and move because you've been displaced again. On average, Gazans have been displaced once a month. Um, people have been able to carry less and less with them each time. Sometimes just physically, you know, you can't carry it. Sometimes because they have to go through checkpoints where they're actually banned from carrying more than a small amount of stuff, you know, so you, you leave your mattress behind, you know, you leave your blankets behind, then what do you do? You have to start again and again and again. But in the, these kind of situations, you know, the fact that 
our staff are able to continue working. Yeah, like I said, one of them said it was partly that was the coping mechanism was to continue working. But it's also about the commitment that they display to do what they do. You know, people from the outside need to look at that and they need to understand how how powerful that is, what the what our colleagues are dealing with. And yet they're still able to do what they're supposed to do. They're still invested with that mission. And we talk a lot about um, the baseline of 500 trucks of aid per day. But what does this mean in practice? What are what are the consequences for the average family in Gaza that instead of being 500 trucks per day, we're talking about 50, 100 or 300? Yeah, no, th this is a very important issue. I mean, you rightly mentioned that this is a baseline because we have to have a sense of, you know, what, what is needed daily to meet the minimum needs of the population. Now, those needs are not static, but, you know, this is a kind of sort of, it's a baseline that we use just to sort of convey what's being achieved or not being achieved. And as you rightly flagged, you know, we've had days where there have been 50 trucks coming in, there's been zero. Um, I mean, one of the bitter ironies is that the, the, the best performance for aid trucks uh, being able to come into the Gaza Strip uh, was 340. And it was about two days before the, the escalation started in Rafa. So, you know, that's, and so then, of course, you know, that sort of glimmer of hope and then slump, slumping, slumping to, to, to zero. And, you know, so that almost, we, I think we, we've kind of got about 500 in the space of a month, you know, which is not a day. So what are the consequences? Well, you know, it's almost mathematical. If you need 500 trucks a day and most of that is food, you're just not replenishing food stocks. Um, they become empty. Well, you know, it's, it's not rocket science, basically, to know that if there's no food, people don't eat. So then what happens? Um, you know, malnutrition rates rise. And we see this all the time. You know, we've seen this. We've been sounding the alarm. Uh, NGOs, United Nations system overall. You know, we've all been sounding the alarm for, for months about, you know, these rising malnutrition rates. Now, you know, sometimes there are glimmers of hope, a little bit of improvement here, a um, little, you know, sort of improvement there, but then something worse happens somewhere else. You know, that might be the escalation in Rafa, which then drives almost all of the the huge numbers of displaced people back to places like Khan Yunis, where they're living among rubble, unexploded ordnance. But what does it mean for an average family? Well, yeah, not having enough to eat means um, starvation. Not having enough to drink means dehydration. You know, so both of those have huge health impacts. But it also means the daily quest to find enough to eat and to drink, and that means people, you know, have to rummage through rubbish dumps. You know, looking for scraps. I mean, it's not like there's scrap food lying, you know, in mounds and mounds and mounds of it um, in the Gaza Strip because people are so desperate. You know, everything gets used, but desperate people will. Take desperate measures. I mean, we've even seen, you know, occasions where our convoys were stormed by desperate people just getting food and eating it on the spot. You know, some people try to call this looting, you know, criminality, but I, I always prefer to see this as it's a it's a, a horrific sign of the level of desperation that people have been forced into, you know, the hunger. But you know, the daily quest to go looking for for food, for shelter, for safety means that people have to kind of put themselves in harm's way more and more. And, and, and in fact, one of the, the most recent tragedies, um, a, a team member who was very well known to, to us in the communications department and, and in external relations with whom, man, who's a very, very dear colleague to, to many of us, um, you know, knew him personally. And, and he was killed along with a couple of members of his family precisely because they were out looking for a new place to stay which might be better, you know, better, closer to potential food supplies, this kind of stuff. And uh, I'm aware of, you know, a handful of cases of colleagues of ours who were killed uh, while out just trying to find something to eat for their family. And they are not any different from other Gazans in that sense, you know. And this is, so that's, you know, what, what, what does the shortfall in aid mean for ordinary people? It means that they have to, you know, they find themselves in desperate situations. And, and that's, that, that's really what it comes down to. According to UNRWA statistics, there are uh, 1.4 million refugees in Gaza out of a population of 1.9 million people. This is equivalent to 74% of the population. You can tell me now if these numbers are up to date or the last ones that I could find. Um, but is there any precedent to this situation? The, the, the number is actually more like 1.6 million uh, registered Palestine refugees uh, in, in the Gaza Strip. 
I mean, overall in the region, it's about 5.9 million registered Palestine refugees. But as I think I mentioned earlier, not everybody who is a registered Palestine refugee accesses UNRWA services. They they may not feel that they need them. For example, they may make up make other choices. But what what you you you've got in the, the Gaza Strip, um, as I mentioned, is you know the 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 majority of of that the population of the Gaza Strip are registered Palestine refugees. So that's like sort of you know intergenerational refugee status. What we we don't distinguish in wartime between being a registered refugee or not, um, because basically the entire population is displaced now. Refugee, uh, of course, you know, under international law, carries a different um, connotation than being internally displaced. But the bottom line is, um, in the Gaza Strip, you have, you know, 1.6 million people who ancestrally um, are registered Palestine refugees because they are our ancestors of people who were displaced in in um, in the uh, in 1948-49 and in some cases subsequently and. But then you have, you have that the entire population has been sort of jumbled up and moved around. I mean, in, 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 overall in the Gaza Strip, it's about 1.7 million people have been displaced from their homes. So, but the, there, what we're talking there is like a refugee crisis of internal displacement, if you like. But those two definitions, of course, uh, as we know, you know, as we're talking about World Refugee Day, the, they mean different things under international law. But the bottom line is somebody who's been forced from their home at some point. And in the Gaza Strip, that is almost everybody now. You recently said elsewhere that it will take over two decades to rebuild Gaza. What will happen to to this immense number of uh, internally displaced refugees and people during during this time? Well, this is this is an important point because you know we we advocate constantly for an immediate ceasefire. I mean that has to be the thing that happens first, so that we people can start to 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 move towards recovery, but. You know, one of the tragedies of maybe not right to say tragedy of a ceasefire because the ceasefire is essential, but one of the the dark sides almost of the ceasefire is waning international attention. On, I mean, this happens in every war. You know, moving into the kind of recovery rebuilding phase, focus shifts elsewhere. You know, the headlines are not the same. Um, now, it's, it's it's critical that the war stops, but we need to maintain a level of attention, a level of commitment to to, to Gaza sustained over over many years to come now rebuilding is um partly because you know the destruction of uh, of buildings i mean you know physical destruction the flattened infrastructure across the gaza strip you know this is the sea of rubble water systems need to be uh, restored all all, all these kind of things so that's the the long game if you like rebuilding that trying to get the economy active again so that people can empower themselves to to rebuild, but the huge amount of international investment that will, will be required—you know—that that it's going to be—it's going to take years. But then the psychological rebuilding, also. I mean, that that the the the, the scars, you know, which uh, people will carry in their minds, will will last for, for you know. I mean, not just the generation which is alive now, because this is is proven around the world. You know, inter- during generational trauma. Um, is carried so the impacts of that, but then the physical scars, of course. You know the the fact that um, over eighty one thousand gardens have been reportedly injured. The 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 fact that bodies are buried in you know scratched graves um, around the Gaza Strip. People finding will be found under the rubble. You know there are many many people who are missing. Um, the number of amputees. Um, shocking figures on the number of amputees and child amputees. You know, you, 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 you know, it's like thousands of children um, affected. And the reconstruction of families, you know, you have thousands of kids who are, uh, you know, I mean, not necessarily orphaned in the sense of having lost both parents, but at least, you know, orphans by losing one parent or uh, indeed not unaccompanied, you know, generally. This sort of category of children, um, I mean, there's this awful sort of jargon term which is used to classify children, you know, who be maybe found, you know, which is unaccompanied child, no surviving relatives. So basically orphan, but not even an extended family to to take them in. Because of course, you know, in the in this region and, you know, this culture, extended families are extremely important. But what do you do when a, a an extended family has been cut down? You know, it's sort of what are the issues for child child safety in such situation? You know, we we see figures um on the number of kids who are working, looking for food, carrying water, um, all the risks associated with that. 
you know, the risk of sexual violence, or, or, or all, all these kind of things. That, 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 that there's some huge, huge challenges of the re- physical reconstruction, the mental reconstruction, the economic and social reconstruction, that this will not happen overnight. And this is why we implore the international community to support all efforts to, 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 to rebuild Gaza. And in a way, that um, takes into account the interests of the population, of course. Because we, we've seen, you know, in situations in other parts of the world sometimes where, you know, rapid reconstruction is, is important, um, but it may actually lead to it being difficult to reconstruct communities as such. You know, people may want to have sort of grassroots rebuilding and these kind of things. So, you know, that this is why the challenges are so immense and why they're going to take so long. Jonathan Fowler, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed for having me on the podcast. Thank you for staying on that side and listening to my conversation with Jonathan Fowler, Senior Communications Manager for UNRWA. If you want to comment on this episode, you can search for Friends of Europe on LinkedIn and X or send us an email. Our address is press at friendsofeurope.org. As always, don't forget to subscribe to Friends of Europe's podcast wherever you get your podcasts to never miss an episode of Policy Voices. I'm Katarina Villanova and I'll be with you again next week. Until then, goodbye.